in Colossians 3 is one that I've taught on a number of times in this church when I had a quick shot. Um, I think one of them was when my grandmother passed away and my mom and dad left quickly and I found out the like the day before church that I needed to have something ready. Uh, I'm not going to be dealing with Colossians 3. It's a stepping off point. Uh, but I do want to make a few comments on the first two verses, well, three verses, we'll say, of this. If, you, if, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died and your life was hidden with Christ in God. Uh, every believer should take that to heart. We are two days away from the new year coming in. I'm told the older you get, the quicker that comes. Oh, please no. <laughs> please no. Uh, it's this year flew by like a thing that flies by really fast. Um, but as we approach this new year, I wanted to think about something with this in mind right here. If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting on the right hand of God. How are we going to do that? I don't normally make New Year's resolutions. I don't know if y'all do. Uh, if you do, that's great. Some people say they make one New Year's resolution, and that's to not make any New Year's resolutions. That's a pretty easy one to mess up because as, as you do it, you already went back on it. Uh, Think about the purpose of these New Year's resolutions that people will make. A lot of times it'll be that they'll eat better, they'll exercise more, they'll save more money, they'll do this, they'll do that, and it's all to make themselves better. But how long do they last? I would suggest probably the average would be about a week. And maybe if you're lucky, a month, and then life goes back to normal because you can't, you can't just stop doing one thing and start doing something else when you've done that one thing for most of your life and all of a sudden now I'm going to stop and change. It's probably not going to happen. Um, habits that come hard to break are ones that you've had a long time, some some people fight with things that they don't want to do for most of their life. Well, I have two New Year's resolutions that I want to make this year, and I want you to consider making them for yourself. Seeking those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. I made one of these the last two years, and I'm not ashamed of it. The other one crossed my mind as I was considering this in the last couple of days as I kind of suspected I would be given the privilege of standing up here this morning. Dad wasn't getting much better and uh, probably wasn't going to make it over here this morning, so I thought, well, I'm going to throw one more into it, into the mix. I have two that I want to make. One of them you're going to find in Second Peter. And this is something that I have chosen of myself to commit myself to in this next year. And I don't expect it to be easy. See, let, let me stop for just a second. Uh, it's in Second Peter 3 for those who are looking it up with me. Um, when we, as believers, commit ourselves to something, when it comes to, okay, we'll say, uh, I'm committed to telling others about Jesus. 
this year. Satan, I guarantee you, will attack you every way he can to make you quit it. Maybe you're feeling convicted over something in your life. Uh, I have this particular bad habit and I need to stop it. Um, I'm going to commit to stopping that. I know of one, a couple of people that have fought with the use of tobacco in this church that struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle and they commit and then next thing you know Satan comes in and just slams on them and it makes their commitment falter. Okay, In committing to these and making them a New Year's resolution for me I am convinced that Satan is going to do everything he can to stop me from accomplishing these throughout the next year. If you choose to make the commitment with me and resolve yourself to this, I'll guarantee you Satan will come after you. But he's not stronger than God. And so these things can in fact be done. And I've proved it with one of them. Okay, it's not this one that we'll be looking at. 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18 says this, and this isn't the only place that it says it. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's my resolution. This year I resolve to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Resolution number one. Why is that important? Because as I face a new year where Christian liberties will undoubtedly begin to falter, if I'm not committed and resolved within myself to do what God has called me to do. And that's this. Then the world will so certainly drag me away. Notice verse 17, what he says there. You, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you fall from your own steadfastness. Be on the guard. You know, you see all, this, all the time, beware of dog signs. That's probably the most common sign on a fence uh, anywhere. There's some no trespassing, some uh, keep out, that kind of thing. But beware of dog is probably the most common one. What does that mean? Think about that. It means don't do something stupid. Be alert, there's a dog here, and it will tear you up if you're wrong. Okay? I won't go in a yard that has one of those on it. It's, well, there's one I will, my brother's yard. He had one for a while, beware of the dog. That dog loved me, so I knew I could get in there and not worry about it. Uh, it was a gigantic pit bull. And he was just the most loving thing to me. I suspect if he didn't know you or if he didn't like you, he probably wouldn't have been so kind. Um, but that was one yard I would go in without worrying about it, even though it said, beware of the dog. But if I don't know the dog, I'm not going in. Okay, that same action is what it's talking about right here in verse 17. Beware. Be on the lookout. Don't go into bad territory so that you don't get hurt. Beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness. What would make us fall? You remember the things we looked at in Colossians 3? They're what would make us fall. Why? Because it has to do with lust. And as a human, 
as any human, we struggle with lust. I want self-gratification. I want self-gratification, but the Bible tells us to. God said in His Word, in Colossians, to, and, and <sighs> Ephesians, and Romans, and different places, Philippians, put these things away. Get rid of these things. Why? Because without it, without doing that, without getting them out of our life altogether, we're not going to be where. And once we've let down our guard, then we won't stand. We can't. There's no possible way we can. Instead, what I want to do this year and what I have resolved myself to do is to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you consider making that resolution along with me? And that we would meet together, not just because it's what we do on Sunday, not because it's what's expected of us, but that we would look into the Word of God for the Word of God and learn the Word of God. Without it, there's no way there's no way possible to grow. We can't do it. David said, it's sweeter than honey. The word of God is sweeter than honey. Jesus, when he was tempted to make bread out of rock, which he could have easily done, he said, man doesn't live by bread alone by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's more important than the food we eat, the Word of God. And if we don't get to know the Word of God, it is impossible to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's all we have to go by. We will never, ever have anything else. There's only two options listed in these two verses. We could either fall from our own steadfastness being led away with the error of the wicked, or we could grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are your two options. You're going to do one or the other this year. You will do one or the other. Well, I come to church. It doesn't always do what it's supposed to do, but I come to church. So... So what? How much time do we spend on, I don't know, Wednesday morning, Tuesday morning, in the Word of God? How about Thursday afternoon? Friday evening, Saturday morning? Compare it to this. How much time do you spend in front of the TV? I can remember times when my children were young. We didn't have a TV. Didn't even own one. And we spent time in the Word of God and it was the most growing time I've ever experienced in my whole life. And you get a TV and what does it do? It draws, draws you away. I'm not talking down about owning a TV. All I'm saying with that is this. Why is it so easy to spend our time on entertainment and so hard to spend our time getting to know Christ? It's a sad thought right there. I am resolved. To grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Very much result. Number two, 
back in the book of Romans. This is one that I've made. This will be my third year in a row. And I'm finding it easier and easier to do, believe it or not. But one that still is difficult at times. A verse that I have memorized and am thankful that I did and I would encourage you to do the same. Romans 1.16 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. I am resolved 100% to not be ashamed of the gospel. Two New Year's resolutions that I will obviously be attacked with. <laughs> I expect Satan to come after me. As long as I am standing on the rock of Christ, I need not worry because he is absolutely faithful. One way I can do that is to get to know him better. The other way I can do that is to practice it. What does it mean to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? If somebody asks me a Christian, if I'm a Christian, I say, yeah. Mm. That might be a light grade of it. Maybe. I wouldn't say, hide that. <laughs> I mean, that would not be a good thing. But in order to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, when somebody says that Buddhism is just as good as Christianity, I say the Bible says that there's not but one way to get to heaven, and that's through Christ, because he died for my sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures, just like the Bible said he was going to do, and he's coming back for me and for you, if you're ready. That's not being ashamed of the gospel. What must I do? I must know the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, the first couple of verses. No more, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, there's that word again, the gospel, which I preached to you, which, it, uh, which you also received and in which you stand, okay? by which also you were saved. Now, this is the gospel by which you're saved. You'll never find that phrase anywhere else in Scripture. Whereas all of the cults and different religions that we have in our community have a different gospel than this. And they'll tell you it's the gospel. And I could go through the list of them. I don't feel like it this morning. But this is what it says. This is the gospel by which you're saved. If I told you, if, uh, if, I, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I did, this is what it is. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which also I received, that it, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now let me ask you this. First off, do you believe that? Do you believe that Christ died that the Messiah, the promised one, God on foot, died for your sins? Let me step a little bit farther back. Do you believe you sinned? I do. I'll prove it in a minute. I don't going to stand up here and sin. I'm saying, I'll, I'll prove it with Scripture. Do we sin? Yes. Christ died for that sin. He was buried. Did they bury him after he died for my sin? Yes. What did he do while he was buried? Conquered death. And he rose again the third day. Everybody, I, I get so tired of this. Everybody says that God 
went down and moved the stone away because it says God raised him from the dead. Who is Jesus? God. I will always believe he didn't need the help of anybody. Lazarus, on the other hand, needed help. When Paul raised that little girl from the dead, he needed help. But Jesus didn't need help. He got up, pushed the stone out of the way, and walked out victorious because he is God. Now, Christ, God on foot, died for my sins and yours. And he was buried. And he rose again, just like the scripture said he was going to. I am resolved to not be ashamed of that. That is absolute in my mind. I told you I was going to prove that I've sinned. Romans 3 tells us this. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the prophets, by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ and uh, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Now here's what it says. This is a little verse, mid-sentence, that's taken out all the time. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's me. Point all the fingers you want to point. I don't care. That's me. I have sinned. You have to. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I can try on my own to come as close as I can to matching up to God's glory. I can obey the law to the letter. I can do all this and I will still fall short. We're all going to come up at different lengths. If we went down here to the river, we were going to try to jump across it. We stand right at the water's edge and jump as hard as we can jump. One of us here would probably get a long ways out. A long ways. The rest of us wouldn't get quite so far. And some of us wouldn't hardly get anywhere at all. We would all fall short no matter what. Now if you had a Jetson's jet pack, you'd get over to the other side. That's the closest I can come to the Jetson's sound. So <laughs> you, you get over to the other side. Well, that's because you have the help of something. You're no longer falling short because of something. What is that? The Holy Spirit. I don't have to fall short of the glory of God anymore because Christ died for my sins. I fall short because of my sins, but Christ died for those sins. Why? Might I be ashamed of that? I should be rejoicing. Christ died for me. And I'm ready to tell them. Because they need to hear it too. Are we going to run around telling everybody we see? Probably not. But there will be people with whom we have contact that we will be telling. Am I ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ when I hear that it's not hard to get to God? All you got to do is blah, blah, blah. You know, go to church, be part of our group, whatever the case might be. There's a hundred different things that we could hear right in our own valley here. Be one with nature. Just last week, somebody suggested we pray to Mother Earth. Is that going to help? No. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, though. 
And if somebody tells me something otherwise, I can say, no, 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 no. This is what God says. Why? Because it requires that we know the Word of God. <laughs> Learn what the Gospel is so you don't have to be ashamed of it. And resolve, I will not be ashamed of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. He added to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, <laughs> that's kind of irrelevant these days. We don't have anybody telling us we have to be a Jew to be saved. <laughs> we don't. I mean, it's just not the way it is. Even if we were out in the secular world, we wouldn't be hearing that. Matter of fact, they'd probably tell you just the opposite. <laughs> Because the Jews are hated. We're probably all Gentile, I would guess. I don't know. Maybe you have Jewish blood in you. I don't know. I don't know all y'all that well. I don't. And I'm thankful that God included the Gentiles in it, in his salvation. Okay, those are two resolutions. I resolve to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ first and foremost. Second of all, I resolve not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Two resolutions I would ask you to make with me. We're going into 2019 a year that probably will see the end of a lot of blessing because of the political mess our country has propagated. You throw God out, you dispose of God, and there's no hope. As a Christian, I expect I will be frowned upon. And in the face of that, I'm resolved. I don't care. Do with me what you will. Treat me however you deem necessary. I will not back down there's a big one abortion what right do we have to kill while well, the United States Constitution said, or no, the United States Supreme Court said we could what did God say shall we prove that wrong how about homosexuality again the Supreme Court says oh it's okay as a matter of fact, we'll promote it. Businesses began saying, uh, for example, Starbucks, saying, if you don't condone um, homosexuality, we don't want your business. You know what I thought? Cool. They don't get any more of my money. And Pepsi said, Starbucks can do it. We can do it. And they did it too. They did one other one with dealing with veterans. They said if veterans are so unstable, they don't need a job. And so I boycotted them. They don't get any more of my money. They backed down. Both of those have now backed down because the boycott stopped it from happening. But because that's their stance, it's over. Okay, why am I getting into all that? Because they're promoting that which is wrong, and God said it's wrong. Now, who do I go by? The United States Supreme Court, or do I go by what God said? How about recreational marijuana? Used to be, people would smoke it to get high. They admitted readily it was mind-altering. 
All of a sudden, now it's not. Because the idiots that are running our government are saying it's okay to do. And now people are running around. They can't figure out why people are getting run over in, in intersections and accidents are happening. Shoot, people are getting shot. Robberies are, ha are way up. Uh, I'll tell you right now, I would not ride a bike in Medford. I would not do it because you're probably going to get run over. I've watched as people sitting there smoking their little pot pipe and hop in their car and take off. Okay. Well, we got to figure out how much is too much. No, any is too much. And God says, don't do it. And the government says, do it. Where do I take my stand? And people... I don't care if there's people in here this morning that believe it's the rightest thing on earth. If God says I can't do it, or if God says it's wrong to do something, then I'm going to say it's wrong to do something. I've lost friends over the homosexuality issue. Good friends. And that doesn't matter to me because I won't back down over it. As far as I'm concerned, if you don't like me, it's your loss. <laughs> That's just how it is. I'm resolved to not step away for the sake of others' feelings toward me. If I do, this is my logic for all of it, if I do, if I step away because of what you think of me instead of what God thinks of me, then he's no longer my Lord, you are. If that's my criteria, then he's not my Lord. You are. You're telling me what I need to do and what I don't. And I dare not call him my Lord and Savior. Rather, I'll call him my Lord because he's the one that calls the shots. And when he says something is wrong, though the government tries to throw God out, you know, just like we heard, no more talk of man. Men. I'll tell you right now, if that word comes out of my mouth, that's going to come out of my mouth. I mean, that's big whoop. I mean, I don't care what the government tries to enforce. And I'm not standing here slamming government or told not to even do that. What I am saying is, is that our society has gotten to such a point that the government is allowed to do things that it shouldn't do, and then people flock to it, and then people that stand their ground with the, with the word of God are, are persecuted. That's what I expect to have happen. In the face of that, I'm going to grow in the grace and knowledge of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Those are the two options. Do it or don't. All I ask is you consider. Consider. Ask God. I'm sharing to you, sharing with you that which God has laid on my heart with the hopes that maybe even one would commit to growing and commit to no fear, no shame when it comes to the gospel. Spreading it like mayonnaise. I like mayonnaise. I would spread it on a lot of things. What do we do? I'm not going to keep pushing it. I think the point has been made. Just so you know, I'm not looking for you to come up to me and say I'm committed to that. Not at all. I, it's not between me and you. It's not between anybody and you. It's between you and God. I'm only sharing it with the hopes. I mean, for one thing, I had to come up with something for this morning. <laughs> uh, but with the hopes that 
maybe somebody will step in with me. Oh, that'd be great. As a church, we need to grow. As a church, we need to not be ashamed. It's not our doing, it's Christ's doing it. So let's let him be the one to make the call. Let's close with prayer. Lord, thank you for your undying love, peace-giving love that says to the world, no matter what you say, I'm right. Thank you for that alone. The world's going to hate you. The world's going to hate us if we stand for you. But that's okay, Lord. Help us to resolve to not go with the flow. If we then have been crucified with Christ, let us also live with Christ. Seek those things which are above. Do the things that you've called us to do. Thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. And commit it to you now in your name. Amen.